Hey everybody, Brian Von Vier back at it again with another set of D&D stories, and today we're going to be talking about, not stories, but in D&D, what was something that was dropped from a previous version that you think should be brought back, and why? Leave it in the comments below. Did you like something in AD&D 2.0, 3.5, or even 5 that was dropped and that you'd like to see come back? I think the second edition weapon proficiency system was better than 3.5's more broad-based simple martial exotic. In second edition, using some of the optional rules, you can learn proficiency in a single weapon or use multiple proficiency slots to learn a related group of weapons – axes, swords, polearms, spears, etc. This meant that unlike a 3.5 fighter, if you had a character who specialized in axe fighting, used a great axe, carried a battle axe as a backup, threw hand axes, etc. He could not just pick up a longsword, halberd, crossbow, or flail and know how to use it without penalty. However, a fighter's penalty was less than a rogue's and much less than a wizard's. I thought that was very functional mechanic without being too cumbersome. For a controversial answer, level limits. You, okay, this is going to get a lot of people riled up, not just for demi-humans, but for all classes. Using experience to have characters grow into their maximum potential only to learn that as the character gets more powerful as an individual, they still can't go it alone as there are always bigger and badder opponents. Original D&D suggested that even 9th level fighters would retire at 9th level to rule a domain. However, that rationale is not really necessary. The player can't rely on their character being top dog going into any situation, and even the group of player characters may need to redefine their strategies for the challenge of starting and finishing weaker than their opponents. In other words, after name level, there are no challenges that can be met with power play strategies. You can, of course, set such a challenge without setting level limits. However, Players that embrace role-playing, as role-playing should be able to understand by their time their character gets to name level, that the goal of the game is not the gaining of levels. Rather, it's not what your characters can do, but what you can do with your character. Like winning <coughs> Breath of the Wild using a link that only has three hearts. That's called a challenge run, my man. One thing that's been dropped is individual weapon specialization, or even proficiency. I think it's unrealistic and takes away from a character's flair. To start using a longsword, then switch to a battle axe as your main weapon because you just found a magic one, then to a polearm because you got an extra feat to spend. Having only a few weapons you can use reliably as a martial class, with the ability to add a couple more or even more by using ASI for an example, keeps your character flavor consistent. Same thing with even fewer options than other classes. And using ASIs to get some weapon specialty, 3.5 had more options than others, but 5th edition would require you to be more selective. I think it's much more flavorful taking ASIs to be specialized in a weapon, getting maybe plus 1 per ASI, than the generic getting plus 2 to a stat. In fact, I would like to see ASIs happen twice as often, and some things like weapon specialization and lesser feats cost 1 without S stat increase. Have a stat increase be 1 per ASI, and some feats cost 2 or 3. I'm not sure how you would implement this in 5th edition, but personally I would like to see something like Thaco come back around. For those of you who have never played 1st or 2nd edition, THACO was an acronym meaning to hit armor class 0. See, in older editions, AC worked like golf scoring. The lower your AC score, the better your AC was. So, a uh, minus 5 AC was pretty damn awesome. But that's beside the point. The main thrust of this was that each class had a different THACO calculation table. There was a lot of math in OG D&D, and it made a lot of sense. Fighters, for instance, had the best chance of landing hits, followed by clerics, then thieves, and finally wizards. We didn't have a whole lot of classes and no subclasses back in the day. Now, why was this a scaled system to determine who hits a base AC? Well, because it made sense. You see, fighters spend all their time learning how to best hit things. Clerics weren't bad because they were warrior priests. Thieves were okay-ish, mostly looking to do a backstab because they were focused on stealing, picking locks, and finding traps. Fighting was a last resort to them. 
and wizards spent all day with their nose stuck in a spell book, leaving no time for martial training, so they sucked at melee. I kind of wish 5th edition still used a mechanic like this, but the way it is now, especially with dexterity becoming a powerful fighting stat with finesse weapons, a wizard has as good of a chance of hitting you as a fighter does. The spell 5th edition way to offset this was to give the fighter more attacks than anyone, save possibly the monk. I'm not looking for gritty realism in my game, but to me this just makes a lot of sense, even though I am enjoying running and playing games in 5th edition as is. I've always wondered why they removed the Horn of Plenty going from 2nd edition to 3rd edition and so on. So of course I brought it back. Horn of Plenty, Aura, Strong Conjuration, CL Construction Level, 12. Slot, None. Price, 12,000 gold. Weight, 2 pounds. This short, slightly curved horn made of braided straw is decorated with images of various foods. Once per day, you can blow a horn of plenty to create a hero's feast as per the spell. Construction requirements, craft wondrous item, hero's feast, 6,000 gold pieces. And a weaker sibling is the royal tablecloth. Aura, faint conjuration, CL5. Slot, none. Price is 6,000 gold pieces and the weight is one pound. This heavy damask tablecloth can produce enough food and drink to feed 16 medium or 8 large creatures for one day. Food created is healthy and nutritious, but otherwise standard fare, unless the user has ranks in craft cooking or a profession chef, in which case they can make a skill check to produce more fanciful food. The food can be produced all at the same time or in smaller portions during the day as desired and appears when the tablecloth is spread on a flat surface and the command word is spoken. The food appears in appropriate bowls, cups, plates, and similar, along with cutlery. The plates and cutlery will vanish after one hour. Construction requirements. Craft wondrous items. Create food and water. 3,000 gold pieces. Now that's pretty good and handy, especially if you're going for a survival campaign way down the line. Consequences for your actions. Oh yes, I've been waiting for someone to say this. As it stands, there's no reason to really try in 5th edition because the worst thing that can happen is that you'll be good as new in 3 days. And that's assuming something like a strong curse or disease that can't be removed with magic. Mere damage is removed by the next day, no matter how much HP you've lost. There needs to be some reason to care whether or not you got hit by an arrow before you eventually and inevitably defeat the enemies. More than that, from an RP perspective, you should have some reason to care whether or not you've been stabbed. In a game about fighting, hit points serve a lot of purposes, and most of those are subverted when you make healing too easy, or in my case, when you start reviving people so often that they basically become immortal and death has no meaning. Dragon Ball Z, we're looking at you. Couple of things. An updated quick and dirty version of the game where 0 HP equals death and all of your abilities are 3d6 straight down the line. Saves are simple, save or die, and you could roll up half a dozen characters to tackle a meat grinder dungeon like the Tomb of Horrors. Lastly, Residium and the Astral Diamonds. Can someone tell me what Residium and Astral Diamonds are in the comments below because I want to be educated. 4th edition, Minions. Admittedly, this is something that can be easily included in 5th edition, or really any edition. Minions can be a great tool for DMs, forcing players to use resources and think more tactically. Combined with abilities like pack tactics and flanking, they can be used to soften up targets. Now, I haven't read much beyond 2nd edition, but what I do miss is the rich, foundational worlds that have novels, characters, and universes devoted to the rule set. When I bought my AD&D, I read them to pieces, yet I almost never found a game to play with people. Each monster was a new story, each campaign setting was a new plot, each fantasy novel added heroes, villains, and culture. You just don't find that in later D&D, just revamping of old worlds. It's like the rich plot and creative writers got turned off somehow. Frankly, I blame computer games and TV. Okay, listen Boomer. <laughs> <laughs> First off, I know what your problem is, I really do, and I agree, 9 out of 10 times, we are getting rehashed, crappy, bland stuff that is easy to digest because people nowadays have the attention span of a small weasel with a lot of cocaine in their system. That's the only problem. Social media is a big one, and the internet is too, and 
take it from me, video games, they just enrich my life, so no. Ah, there you go, thinking that you're being limited by the edition you play. I, as a DM, will cheerfully steal anything from any game I like. For instance, the initiative system I use starts at the number with the highest character's initiative and goes down. Guess when you get to go. But you won't find that written up anywhere. I have people that want to create things. If you limit them by the edition you're supposedly playing, you're limiting their creativity. Limits are what ended up causing TSR to go out of business. There are a lot of great answers here, but no one's mentioned skill ranks yet. And it's an excellent example of 5th edition oversimplifying the game world. 5th edition is great for making the gameplay easy for beginners, but it does so at the expense to richness and detail in the world. Yes, it was somewhat annoying to figure out where to put your skill ranks each level in 3.5, but it meant you were dialing in your character and could focus on particular skills. It was an interesting puzzle of balancing out your resources versus what you wanted your character to become. Did you miss several critical spot checks last level and want to put all of your points into that? Or are you going to focus on your absurdly good tumble so you can eventually climb vertical surfaces? Why did your character get better at a particular task? 5th edition's lumping together of skills makes it easy to play, but let's be honest, seeing something far away is an entirely different competency from being able to listen carefully and a good swimmer is not necessarily a good climber. Yes, it's an imaginary world, I know, but what helps make imaginary worlds more vibrant is the ability to play in complex ways. The Harry Potter and Star Wars Lego sets are not made out of the plastic Duplo blocks. Hey everyone, Brian Von Vier here. Make sure to leave a like, subscribe, ring that bell, and of course, let us know in the comments below what you wish would be brought back and why, or changed in general, because we like to know and you might actually influence the game one day. You never know. You know the developers probably read this stuff or listen to it, so go ahead, put it in the comments below, and make sure to stay happy, hydrated, and healthy. We love you all. Please be safe out there. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.